Yeah, great. Good evening. We're glad you came out for this event, and uh, there's probably more going to trickle in the back uh, as we begin, but I um, wanted to set things up for you uh, with a few ground rules and things like that, but first of all, to say what this is all about. This sign behind me uh, represents something, represents Trinity Fellowship, which is an organization that we established several years ago um, to interact with the university and talk about issues of faith and the life of the mind in a way that uh, sparks curiosity in people. We have hosted a number of different events and seminars at IU, sometimes here. The value of having them here is you don't have parking problems, right? We all know about that. Uh, at IU, we do have a lot of parking problems. Let me give you just an overview. If you go to our website, tfiu.org, you can read more about uh, our vision statement and also some of the things that we've done. Um, but let me give you this. It comes straight from the website. It says, we desire to engage in honest inquiry with academic integrity, discussing difficult questions while remaining humble in our conclusions. We don't have all the answers, but we refuse to avoid the difficult questions. We want to promote theological curiosity and contribute to the common good. We want to avoid activities that divide us from the very campus culture we seek to serve. And we want to create an environment that affirms Christian truth claims and is generous to those who differ from us. So we really want this to be ongoing conversation uh, of an academic quality. The kinds of things that we've sponsored uh, over the last few years, um, I'll just read you a, a, a list of those. We had a lecture entitled, I'm a believer and a skeptic, is that okay? We had a lecture entitled, How Can I Connect Science with My Faith? We had a panel discussion that was entitled, Truth Claims in a Pluralistic Culture. We had a lecture um, that was sponsored through the Veritas Forum, Reckoning with Evil, a discussion of God, philosophy, and hope. And we also had a series of lectures related to issues of textual reliability and canonicity. In addition to that, we have sponsored several events related to environmental concerns and creation care. We had a speaker, Kyle Mayard Skop, um, whose title was Creation Care, Climate Change and the Gospel. We also had a, a forum, which was really three workshops on a similar topic, Creation Care and the Earth's in Changing Environment. And that was hosted by concerned scientists at IU and the Trinity Fellowship at ECC. Uh, and it was a dialogue uh, about these issues, integrating faith and science and earth stewardship. Um, there's two people I want to mention that are not the speaker tonight. One is the co-director of Trinity Fellowship who really does all the work, and that's Dan Waugh. So thank you very much, Dan, for setting everything up. All the way to the back, the guy with the really big beard. His name is Sam Baldenau. Yes, uh, Sam is InterVarsity Graduate Fellowship Rep. Uh, he takes care of things over there on campus, and he has co-sponsored this with us, and we're really happy that he's here as well. So let me give you a brief overview of how the evening's going to go. Uh, first, our speaker is going to speak for roughly 45 minutes, and then following that, we're going to do a Q&A period up here. I'll be here with him. We're going to alternate between two forms of communication from you. One form of communication is via text, and Dan at some point will show you how to do that. Uh, it'll just appear on the screen and you'll know how to do it. I think he's clicking something now that's not working. Um, during the lecture, that will be up there. You can text in questions. Those questions will come to an iPad that I'm holding up here, and I will read those questions for you. We'll take a text question first. And following a answer to a text question, we're going to allow you to ask a question out there. Some of you actually want to be seen and heard. We understand that. So we're going to alternate between text questions and live questions. And we have two people who are spotters in um, the audience on either side with a microphone, and they'll bring it to you. Um, 
here's, here's the suggestion. No, it's not a suggestion. It's not even a request. It's a mandate. When you ask a question, please make it a question. Okay? Don't launch your lecture or what you think about a topic. Ask a question. Because if you go on and on, the person who's holding the mic is instructed to just pull it away and let the thing be over, right? So be, be kind to us, okay? Ask good questions, concise, think them through. Um, as we've mentioned concerning this lecture tonight, there are a few things that are more polarizing today than political dialogue. Um, as a matter of fact, it seems that real dialogue on politics has almost evaporated on occasion. Um, but we're committed to engaging subjects like this and others. And we are just very much honored to have Dr. Matt Tuninga, Associate Professor of Moral Theology at Calvin Theological Seminary, to present for us tonight. He previously taught at Emory University, Oglethorpe University, um, and he also has spoken around the country. He had a sabbatical in the fall. We spent a good bit of time in New Zealand, or Australia, Australia, um, and uh, gave some lectures there. He told me just a little bit ago that the lecture he's giving now was actually a five-part series in Australia. So you can imagine how he's trying to condense it for us tonight. Um, his uh, first book was Calvin's Political Theology and Public Engagement of the Church, Christ's Two Kingdoms, and it was published by Cambridge University Press. Um, it is a, a real honor to have him here. I have heard him speak on campus, and I asked him at that time if he would return in the spring and speak to us, and we're just uh, very delighted that he's here. So, Dr. Tunigan, come forward. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here, and Robert, I appreciate the invitation, and also Sam for uh, sponsoring this too, and, and Dan and everybody who was involved. Um, it's, it's always a privilege to be able to come speak on a topic in which everybody's going to be mad about you for something that you say. We live in a ridiculously polarized time. I'm not going to say it's the most polarized we've ever been in this country. We did have a civil war. Uh, but you see it in the media. You see it in educational institutions. You probably see it uh, at your workplaces with friends, if you have friends on the other side. Rarely has it been so difficult to have conversations about important political issues without feeling like we're just drifting further and further apart. Republicans are moving further and further to the right. Democrats are moving further and further to the left. And that's been happening for some decades. Some of the symptoms are that nothing really of substance gets done in Congress. There's a few things that have been passed on very partisan lines, but nothing like the sort of legislation Congress used to pass. As a result, with Congress's power actually weakening because it's not doing as much, the presidency and the courts become all the more significant because that's where the real power is. And these branches of government, therefore, become contested with increasing bitterness and intensity. That's why the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation process in 2018 was the way it was, where he was confirmed on partisan lines, and whether you were a Republican or a Democrat dictated whether or not you thought he probably was guilty of sexual assault or not. That's why the Donald Trump impeachment process in 2019 and 2020 was so vitriolic, where if you thought he should be impeached or not, once again, depended not on, on who you were really, but whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. This sort of frustration that happens over polarization in politics, in turn leads, to, leads people to express that in other areas of culture, and leads, I think, to a politicization of American life in general. And all of this happens even though studies show and polls suggest most Americans don't actually identify very much with the extremes, but find themselves closer to the middle. And it's people in the middle that are often the most exasperated by what's going on. This polarization has deeply affected Christians. Often, 
uh, the church is just a mirror image of the political parties. This is not a new thing, but I think it's getting worse. Christians who are most concerned about issues like abortion, sexual immorality, secularization, and the growth of government or American decline tend to vote Republican, even if the Republican Party's platform and uh, policies violate long-standing Christian teaching on any number of other issues. Christians who are most concerned about racism, discrimination, poverty, damage to the environment, or inequality tend to vote Democratic even if the Democratic Party's positions and practices violate long-standing Christian teaching on any number of issues. And so, as Christians, we too are sucked into this right versus left conflict. And yet, it hasn't always been this way. If you go back a hundred, uh, several hundred years behind the Enlightenment, the politics of the right and the left would have made little sense to Christians. If you read mainstream theologians like Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and John Calvin, you will find that they emphasized uh, Christian teachings about care for the poor and the just use of property, as well as things like sexual morality. You will find that they were as concerned about unbridled human liberty as they were about tyrannical government. Words like conservative and liberal meant nothing to them. And words like love and justice and peace and truth meant everything. It's not that they got everything right. I'm not saying if we only went back you know, before modernity, then we'd have all our problems solved. But they did have a kind of Christian perspective, untainted by this polarization in right and left, that can be very refreshing for us. And I would submit that it can help us recover a distinctly Christian perspective. So, I want to do two things here. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about what happened and where, why I think we've gone wrong, why polarization is such a problem. And then secondly, I want to... Uh, sort of outline the basics of, I think, a better Christian political theology that can help us transcend that polarization. So first of all, uh, where did we go wrong? How did Christian politics become hijacked by the politics of the right and of the left? And where did this spectrum of right and left even come from? Well, interestingly, the, the words the, as political labels, originally, they first uh, arose as references to the seating arrangements of the French Parliament during the French Revolution. Those who sat to the right of the chair of the president supported the old monarchist regime and the feudal hierarchy, which they saw as reflections of the natural moral order. They upheld the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, which was the greatest property owner in France at the time. Those who sat on the left supported the revolution. They called for the abolition of the old order in favor of liberty, equality, and fraternity. They rejected the authority of the church, insisted on the rule of reason, and on respect for the natural rights of all human beings. Now this ought to raise the question in your mind, how did it happen that the church came to be pit against basic ideas like liberty and equality, or even reason? And how would the natural order be pit against natural rights? It was Christianity, after all, that taught the West the value of the individual in the first place, and books have been written about this. The ancient world reduced the value of people to their status in the social hierarchy. You were either a slave or you were free. You were either rich or you were poor. You were a husband and father or a wife and mother. Christianity came along and highlighted the dignity of every single human individual as a person made in the image of God. It was the Apostle Paul who declared that because Christ set us free, we should not become slaves of human beings. It was the Apostle James who called Christians to treat rich and poor as equals since God shows no partiality. Christians were the ones who outlawed prostitution and the sex trade and eventually abolished slavery. 
Christians were the ones who emphasized that property rights were less important than the rights or than the needs of the poor. Christians were the ones who called all people to be united in solidarity with each other in the body of Christ. So why in the French Revolution did so many of these very ideals of Christianity, albeit developed maybe in slightly different ways, but how did they all get to be turned against Christianity itself? Now, part of the problem, it's complicated, of course, but part of the problem was that over the centuries, many Christians, especially those who had positions of power, and remember, most theologians were among the elites of society, but many Christians had learned to downplay the social implications of the gospel. And by the 18th century, in a world where poverty was on the rise and those who had authority were reluctant to give it up, The Roman Catholic Church and its clergy, by and large, there were exceptions, but by and large, they committed themselves to holding on to their positions of power and to the status quo. And so it was logical that the revolutionaries would therefore reject the church along with the regime with which it was identified. And then it made sense that since it was under attack, the church in turn rejected the revolution and everything that it stood for. And so, especially in France, but France becomes the place from which liberalism is exported to other countries, especially in France, the forces of democracy, individualism, liberty, and equality became identified with the forces of secularism. And the church became identified with hierarchy and narrow-minded traditionalism. And in the hands of revolutionaries, ideas of justice and liberty and equality were increasingly divorced from the Christian teaching that gave rise to them in the first place. And Christians were forced to decide whether they were fundamentally liberals who supported the revolution and natural rights, or whether they were conservatives who supported the church and the status quo. Which would you choose? Which have you chosen? At first, most liberals maintained classic Christian teaching, especially in countries like Britain and the United States. And so some of these trends were were truer in France than they were in places like the United States. And people like Alexis de Tocqueville acknowledged that and, and highlighted that fact. Classical liberalism, associated with figures like the British philosopher John Locke, rooted their commitment to government by consent and to the rights of life, liberty, and property in basic Christian teaching about the image of God and about the law to love one's neighbor as oneself. They viewed tyrannical government as the greatest threat to liberty and equality, and they urged that government's powers should be severely limited, even if that meant tolerating evils such as property or such as poverty, sorry, and slavery. It should sound familiar because Locke's philosophy was very influential among the founders of the United States. And in the United States, there there really was a sort of a, a sort of compromise or even synthesis of classic Christian. Uh, political theological perspective and this sort of classical liberal perspective. But when classical liberalism failed to produce the liberty, equality, and fraternity that the revolution promised over the course of the 19th century and into the 20th century, many liberals gradually turned to what we might now call progressive liberalism or eventually social democracy and then socialism. Inspired by radical philosophers like the Swiss writer Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they viewed the social order as a purely human construction that could be deconstructed and reconstructed at will. They called for government to take an increasingly proactive role in regulating the economy, empowering the individual, and promoting equality, even if that meant curbing property rights. The most radical of this sort, people like Karl Marx, ultimately called for the wholesale deconstruction of society and its reconstruction in accord with the values of a purely secular order. And this became communism. So liberalism evolved into a spectrum of increasing radicalism, running from classical liberalism on the one hand, through to progressive liberalism, socialism, and ultimately communism. 
But conservatism, the reaction against this whole trajectory, spawned its own forms of extremism and authoritarianism. Fascists began to reject uh, democracy and individualism in favor of national greatness. Racists and social Darwinists called for the rule of one ethnic group over another for the sake of human progress or, or, the, or the advance of their own nations. And, and by the 20th century, the politics of many nations throughout the globe were conceived in strictly ideological absolutist terms. Everything was at stake. Power became an all or nothing struggle. When fascists and Nazis went to war with communists and liberals during World War II, tens of millions of people died because of the ideologies of modernity. And many more faced the prospect of nuclear annihilation in the second round when it looked like communism and liberalism might face off during the Cold War. Now thankfully, most of the wars have ceased. But the conflict of left and right, this ideological struggle, continues to be the defining characteristic of our politics. And, and th what I'm about to say is a vast oversimplification, but I think it, there's a lot of truth to it. What we've seen in many ways in this country is an in increasing alliance, often an uneasy one, but an alliance between the forces of conservatism and classical liberalism, the early form of liberalism. An alliance between conservatism and classical liberalism against the forces of progressive liberalism, socialism, and secularism. So classicalism, classical liberalism has actually come to be associated more with the right than with the left. Traditionalists, libertarians, and nationalists tend to gravitate toward the Republican Party, while progressives, socialists, and secularists support the Democrats. Now, I find that to be a rough choice. It seems to me that what is lost in all of this is a distinctive Christian political witness. Christians get seduced by one or the other of the camps, depending on their own social context and outlook, often just depending on their race, their socioeconomic status. But both sides are driven more by reaction against the other than by any sort of coherent moral political vision. And meanwhile, my sense is for Christians on both sides that they become increasingly bitter because they're both experiencing the same phenomena. A society in which political hopes and dreams are constantly disappointed and in which Christianity is increasingly marginalized. It's a society in which genuine uh, deliberative democracy or even anything like it is increasingly replaced by simply attempts to wield power over the other side and do what you can get away with. And these trends, I would argue, have continued and become worse whether a Democrat or a Republican is in the White House. We are in a crisis. We feel paralysis. Many people feel despair. I think the problem, at least for those of us who are Christians, is that we've allowed modernity, the modern world, to set the terms for our own way of approaching politics. We've allowed ourselves to be forced into taking sides in the all-consuming revolutionary conflict between the right and the left. And that sort of conflict is actually alien to the Christian perspective. So that's, I think, how we've gotten where we are. One of my fears is that as Christians, when we see the ways in which the ideals of modernity are abused and, and the, the, the wrong directions that they're taken in, we're tempted to react by just rejecting those principles wholesale. We're, there, there's plenty of people who are becoming increasingly disenchanted with liberal democracy itself. I think that's tragic, and I worry about that in the long run, that the breakdown of trust, the breakdown of confidence in our system um, will come about because of this. But I think what we as, as Christians need to think about is how we can recover the origins and the sources of those principles 
where they first came from within the Christian tradition and reinvigorate them as our, our guiding light when we engage in politics and in some ways as a gift that we can continue to offer. In other words, what we need is the recovery of a gospel-centered political theology. Only a political theology rooted in the gospel of the kingdom, not of the right or the left, will give us the moral political vision that can transcend the politics of the right and the left. Only a political theology of the kingdom can give us and our neighbors hope. Now, the paradigm I'm going to give you, and uh, as Robert kind of hinted at, this is really the really, 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 really short version of it. Uh, it's heavily influenced by John Calvin, who I wrote my first book on, and there's a couple copies out there that you could look at if you want. It's influenced by Calvin, but not just Calvin, but a, whole, a host of prominent Christian theologians, from Augustine to Thomas Aquinas, from Martin Luther to Abraham Kuyper, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Martin Luther King Jr., and on and on. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a Calvinist framework, but one that's been tweaked and adjusted in conversation with these other figures. In his famous work, The City of God, which is kind of like the baseline foundation for all Christian political theology, Augustine pointed out that while the Roman Empire offered its people a form of justice and peace and virtue, that justice, peace, and virtue fell far short of the real deal. At its heart, the politics of Rome were rooted in self-love and domination. Now, Augustine said, that peace, virtue, and justice is better than none at all. He, he welcomed the peace of the Roman Empire. It's better than what had come before it. But nevertheless, it fell far short of the real deal. Only in the city of God, he argued, can we achieve true justice, peace, and virtue. And that is because in the city of God, Christ empowers us through the Holy Spirit to love God and to love one another in God. And this insight, comparing what, we can, what the city of God actually gives us to what the, city, the, the worldly city can only aspire to, led Augustine to understand what I think is the core principle of a Christian political theology of hope. And that is that worldly politics always disappoints us, but that nevertheless, because of the gospel, our political hopes are not in vain. They will one day be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So worldly politics always disappoints, but that doesn't make our political longings vain because they will one day be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now this insight that Augustine had, could lead Christians to go in different directions, and it very much has. Everybody claims Augustine is on their side. I will too. We could say, based on what Augustine is telling us, that Christians should abandon earthly politics since it always fails. It's better to separate ourselves and keep ourselves pure so that we don't get our hands dirty. We would call this the sectarian temptation. Now, Augustine actually rejected sectarianism because he believed that Christians are called to serve their earthly neighbors by taking up political vocations. Even though we can't make the world perfect, he said, we can still make it a lot better than it would otherwise be by doing what we can to conform its practices and institutions to the righteousness of the kingdom of God. Another error that Augustine did not distance himself from was the error of thinking that Christians need to seize power and use force to try to turn our earthly uh, societies into expressions of the kingdom of God. And this became the, the basic temptation of Christendom. Christians from the medieval popes to the Puritans who founded New England argued that in a just society, the godly must rule. It's no accident that they talked about this in the context of colonialism. But even well-known uh, Christian theologians who were in no sense authoritarians or colonialists, like Abraham Kuyper, emphasized that Jesus has declared that every square inch of this creation is his. And that has tempted many of Kuyper's followers to think that therefore every inch of creation is ours to rule. 
I think the religious right in America had the same dream, where Christians would rule America. But it was a dream that led to bitterness, because it was a dream that was rooted in a false triumphalism. And I would argue that it's not the right Christian mindset. Rather, the proper Christian mindset, it's not sectarianism, it's not Christendom, but it is self-sacrificial service in imitation of Christ. And here I want to give you a couple quotes from the New Testament to give you a sense of what I mean here. The most important one is Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, where the Apostle Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He's telling you what your mindset should be. This is a worldview passage. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul's saying that should be the mindset of Christians in the world. Jesus said something that fits well with this to his disciples in Luke 22. He said, the kings of the nations lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Why? For I am among you as one who serves. This is a mindset, the mindset of Christ, that of self-sacrificial service, uh, that embodies both hope, hope in this new path that Christ has set out before us, and humility. It avoids passivity and separation on the one hand, but it also avoids triumphalism and arrogance on the other. What we need, however, in order to have this mindset is a proper theology to underlie it. It's not, it's not just that if, if you try to be humble and, and be a servant, you have enough. We need a proper theology of the kingdom and how it works in history in order to ground this sort of hopeful service, hopeful humility. We need what John Calvin called a theology of two kingdoms. What the Apostle Paul describes in terms of the two, two great ages of history, what theologians call eschatology. You don't have to remember that word if you're not a theologian. The core insight here is that as Christians, we need to distinguish the present evil age, which will pass away, from the coming age of the kingdom of God. The present evil age is the world affected by sin and death and misery. It's what Christians historically called the secular. The secular was what is passing away. It includes earthly institutions and arrangements like government, property, marriage, and the family. All this, Christians historically said, will pass away one day. But the age to come, the future, is eternal. It is an age of love and justice, of peace and worship of the true God. Now, in one sense, Christians are waiting for this future age because it won't be fully inaugurated until Christ returns. But in another sense, Christians have always said, the age to come already exists. It has already begun in Jesus through his resurrection from the dead. And so the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1 that in Christ all things have been reconciled, although we haven't fully seen the results of this. It's, it's the classic tension of the Christian life, often summed up through the, the phrase, the already and the not yet. The Christian gospel is that Jesus has reconciled all things, and that human beings can participate in this reconciliation by becoming followers of Jesus. When we become followers of Jesus, we become united in the body of Christ, and we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to begin, notice begin, practicing the love and justice of Christ's kingdom, even in this present evil age, because we're participating in the future age that's coming. And so, 
we begin to treat one another in accord with love and justice. We begin to practice solidarity and generosity toward the poor. Those who are in positions of authority, as, as theologians like Augustine and Martin Luther said, serve those under them rather than try to dominate them. And so hierarchical relationships are transformed into relationships that, that are, are turned to serve a more foundational underlying equality. The weak are empowered and slaves are set free. Human beings begin to experience the gift of liberty, although that liberty is always qualified by the responsibilities of mutual service. In short, when Christians become followers of Jesus, if they are followers of Jesus, and if they do what he commanded, living for that kingdom and its righteousness that is coming in the future age, they witness to the fact that one day, this evil, unjust, oppressive world will be turned upside down. And everything will be made right. This is what Jesus was preaching in the Gospel of Luke when he said this, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. This is radical language. This is potentially revolutionary language. And perhaps it makes you think, well, is this not simply another ideology? Is this not the very sort of rhetoric and ideology that will lead to the kind of revolutionary violence that was so disastrous in the 20th century? And that's a fair question. Joseph Stalin himself, you may be aware, began as a seminarian. He was inspired by Christian teachings, and later he lost his faith, but he didn't lose his inspiration for social justice. So it's a fair question. It will become simply another ideology that is used to justify violence if we attempt to accomplish it in a way that is different from what Jesus did. In other words, if we attempt to accomplish it through the seizure and use of power over other people. However, if we have the mindset of Jesus, of self-sacrificial service, and we don't think of our politics as sort of forcing the world to this future reality, but as witnessing to it in the various ways that we serve one another, then it will be different. We will realize that the servant is not greater than their master. Jesus witnessed to the reality of the kingdom by suffering and dying on a cross. We can only follow him by doing the same, taking up our cross. Or as the New Testament says, we can only witness to the righteousness of the kingdom by living into the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that can only happen through service marked by suffering. That's why Jesus says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for justice will be satisfied, but that doesn't mean that during the present age they will not cease to hunger and thirst. That's why he says that those who are persecuted for the sake of justice will receive the blessing of the kingdom, but they will also continue to be persecuted. It's when we witness to love and justice in the context of suffering and death, more willing for others to harm us than we are to harm them, that we demonstrate that our hope is in the God who brings life out of death, resurrection out of the cross. Our hope does not come from uh, our confidence that we will win our political battles in the time and place in which we live. In fact, as Christians, we won't even always agree about what political battles we should be fighting or what side we should be on. No, our hope comes from the fact that no matter how strong evil appears to be at the present time, we know that in the long run, in the future age, justice will prevail. And we are so confident of that 
fact of that future that we are willing to devote our lives to it in the meantime. We know that we won't always agree about policy or about what party to support, but we do share a common commitment to the kingdom vision of love and justice and peace, to the genuine kind of liberty and equality that is rooted in our identity as human beings made in the image of God. And so whatever party we're part of or whatever policies we propose, they'll always at least, for us as Christians, be oriented towards that vision if we are being faithful. Now, what are some of the practical implications of this? Well, I don't have time to say very much here, but I want to conclude with three basic points. All of them I've already hinted at, but let me make them clearer. First, it has to be the coming kingdom and its righteousness, the age to come, that sets the political vision for Christians, not the politics of the right and the left. And that means that our ultimate goal when we get involved in politics cannot be partisan victory. It cannot be to preserve the status quo or make America great again. It's not to enforce Christian morality on the rest of the country, and it's certainly not to make American culture conform to the cultural practices of Jesus' time. But nor, on the other hand, is our ultimate goal progress in the direction of greater and greater individual liberty and equality regardless of moral constraints. Those are the false promises of modernity of the left and the right. Our goal, our vision, is to seek love and justice and unity and peace and, yes, liberty and equality as they've been revealed to us in Christ. Jesus is establishing a new humanity in which, as the Apostle Paul himself says, all barriers between people are being broken down. In this new humanity, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. We might add that there's neither American or immigrant, Democrat or Republican, and the significance of male and females transcended by our solidarity as children of God. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. called the vision of the beloved community. It's a future of which the prophets of the Old Testament spoke, a time in which no one is afraid or is in need because everyone can sit under their vine and their fig tree. Everyone is enabled to participate because all are image bearers who've been commanded by God to exercise dominion in this world. Now, we know we won't achieve all of that. That's the fact that we're in this already and not yet. But that still remains our guiding vision. That's what Augustine was saying when he was saying that Rome can give us a sword of of justice and a sword of virtue. But as Christians, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the true vision of justice and virtue. And that informs the way in which we then serve in our political contexts. So the kingdom and its righteousness is our vision. Second, the focal point of our witness to this political future is not actually in the political arena, first and foremost, but in the church. That's really important. I think as Christians, we need to worry less about what the world is doing wrong and more about how we are failing our mission. In our preaching and teaching in our churches, are we actually preaching the whole vision of the kingdom of God and its righteousness? I'm not talking here about are we preaching partisan politics. Pastors have no business talking about policy or elections from the pulpit, in my view. But they do have the obligation to teach the full love and justice of the kingdom of God in such a way that those who are hearing them, the disciples of Jesus, can then think about how those ideas might apply in politics and in policies. What about the ways we live together as Christians or we, we, we live as the body of Christ in our churches? Do our churches, in fact, model the spiritual and material solidarity of Christians across racial, economic, and political boundaries? In the way that we celebrate the Lord's Supper, do we highlight the fact that we are a new humanity where all people are called to be one? Do we secure justice for all who are of our number through the ministry of the diaconate and even helping those who are outside of our number as we are able? 
Do we hold one another accountable to love and justice through church discipline? If we did these things and really focused on actually being the new humanity Jesus talked about, I think that would shape the political ethos of Christians. I think it would affect the way they went out into the world and engaged politics, even if their pastors aren't telling them exactly how to vote or what they should do. But the tragic fact is that too many of our churches simply mirror the politics of the Democratic and Republican parties. You go to one church and they pander to the left. You go to another church and they pander to the right. And too many Christians are more concerned with winning political battles and keeping outsiders out than they are about carrying on the mission of Jesus. So we need to focus on the church, being the church, not just in the way we teach theology or do doctrine or talk about people being saved, but in the way we actually embody the new humanity that Jesus has called us to be. And then third, our mode of political engagement should be service, not domination. We are always to remember that our neighbors, whether they're Christians or not, are fellow image bearers. And that means that they have been commanded by God to exercise dominion in this world. Political governance is a gift we share with all people. As I heard John Perkins recently say, we need to get past this mindset that we are better than other people. We don't have the right to dominate them, nor should we try to. We are to seek the good of all people. We should be concerned not just with issues that affect ourselves, such as religious liberty, although it's a good thing to be concerned about. And we should not just be, be focused on a few matters of morality that happen to be especially provocative to our consciences, like abortion and sexuality, although those are good things to be concerned about. But we should have the broader vision that includes all people and, and that ensures that we seek justice and peace for all people, especially those who are poor and vulnerable. This means that we are zealous for the good of our inner cities and of our rural backwaters. It means we're concerned about the environment and about public health. It means we do what we can to promote meaningful equality since we know that God shows no partiality. At the same time, we need to be aware of the limits of politics. There is always going to be evil that government can't stamp out. And if we try, it will too often become totalitarian a utopia often turns into a dystopia, or an attempt at a utopia turns into a dystopia. John Calvin, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, all of them acknowledged that the, even the Old Testament laws of Israel tolerated and accommodated certain forms of evil simply because you're dealing with sinful human beings. Right? And so, so the, the Old Testament laws of Israel allowed them to kill men who surrendered in war. Calvin says that doesn't mean that was right, it's abominable. But nevertheless, it accommodated their sin, sinful uh, human nature. If that's true of Israel of old, then how much more would that be true of the governments in the times and places in which we live, and especially of America? We have to work with people, doing the best that we can without alienating them unnecessarily. We need to remember that we're called to be one body politic, even with non-believers. And the way that we pursue our vision of political justice should reflect this truth. As Christians, we need to stop thinking of politics as a winner-take-all ideological struggle for power. That's how we've often thought about it in this country. That's not what politics is. Politics is a vocation of loving service toward our neighbor that is rooted in Christian witness. It's really, you know, when you're engaging in politics, it's really not so different from what you're doing when you're working with your neighbor because a tree fell on your common fence. You get together with them, you love them, and you serve them, and you try to work something out that works for everybody. It's when we imitate 
Jesus, by taking up the form of servants, willing to love our neighbors to the point of dying for them, that we communicate a new kind of hope to politics. We communicate that today might be the day of violence and oppression, but tomorrow we will enter into a kingdom of justice and peace. And the good news is that already today, as Christians, we believe we have the power to begin moving toward that reality, to allowing it to begin shaping our politics, if only in small ways. I wonder what it would do to our witness as Christians if we had the reputation of being those people who always sought the good of their neighbors. If people thought of Christians as the ones who would always stand up for you and make sure that you got a fair shake. What would it look like in politics if we convinced all people, whatever their race or economics or or politics or religion, that we are for them just as God is for them in Christ? Even then, if they disagreed with our judgments or our practices from time to time, they would at least acknowledge that we love them, that our vision for them is indeed one of love and justice. And I think that would be a form of politics that would bring hope in a despairing and polarized world. There have been much darker times. There have been much more polarized times. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived at a time when you had Nazis fighting communists. He himself was drafted into the German army. And all of Western civilization was collapsing. Bonhoeffer could have been very discouraged. He could have done what many Christians did and just withdraw into their little shell. But that's not what he did. Because he said all of this, which seems so real, all this war, all this uh, oppression and death and injustice, is really an abstraction. He didn't mean that in the sense that it's not real. What he meant was that it's... It's the way of things that are passing away. It's the old way. But the true future of all things is in Christ. And as Christians, we express our hope in that future by acting with Christ-like responsibility for our neighbors, even in times of the worst darkness and tragedy. And so for Bonhoeffer, that meant that no matter how bad things were during World War II in Nazi Germany, he as a Christian would take responsibility for his neighbor, which in his case he thought of particularly as the Jews. For Bonhoeffer, that meant taking part in a resistance movement against Hitler, and ultimately it meant that Bonhoeffer was executed. At the time it looked like failure. It looked a lot like Jesus going to the cross. But today everyone looks back at Bonhoeffer as having been a successful, faithful Christian witness in the way he engaged politics. That's because he kept his mind focused on Christ, on the future of the world in Christ, and he said, whatever is happening in the world, I'm going to live and act in that reality on behalf of my fellow human beings. Thank you.